Hi, Year 12. This is Mr. As a Party with another video about Buddhism. <clears throat> uh, this one is part two of uh, another video that we did. Um, not the last lesson we did, because the last lesson we did, we talked about an essay uh, to do with meditation, but the lesson before that we were doing about this topic. How can teachings about samsara be interpreted as psychological, metaphorical? This is part two. What I'm going to do in this video is go over some of the stuff we looked at last time. So it'll be useful if you've got your notes from last time. I'm going to go over the questions that I set you to do with a reading from Stephen Batchelor and go through the answers to that. And then we're going to talk about um, how we might put this stuff into an essay. And we're going to do a kind of plan of an essay and write a peril for that essay. OK, so if you remember, we started, we looked at the fact that in se secular Buddhists don't believe literally in teachings of relating to samsara. By teachings relating to samsara, I particularly mean karma, rebirth. The six realms of rebirth, dependent origination, those kind of ideas. So they would reinterpret those teachings in different ways, in, in what we'd call metaphorical or psychological ways. So in ways which say that these teachings are not literal teachings, i.e. you're not literally reborn in a different realm after you die. And also, you know, karma is not like a literal kind of magical power where if you do something good, magically something good happens to you. No, they reinterpret them so that they're, they're interpreted in a psychological way. So how do they do that? Well, karma is taken to refer to the psychological effects of good or bad actions in this life. So it's not that, you know, I don't know, a more magical one would be, you know, if you if you kill someone in this life, then I don't know, um, magically, I don't know, you, in your next life, a piano will fall on your head and you'll die, you know, like a, like a, a supernatural occurrence like that. Um, for them, for secular Buddhist karma would be like this. You uh, you do something uh, self-centered in this life and it affects you psychologically. You become um, less happy. You become more, um, less feel less connected to other people. It just generally diminishes you and your happiness in this life. And if you do positive things, if you're generous, then you feel happy. So that's karma interpreted psychologically. Rebirth is interpreted as happening moment to moment. So it's saying, well, when we say rebirth, we don't mean when you die, you're reborn as someone else. It's more linked into the teaching of Anatta to say, well, actually, according to Anatta, you are a different person every moment because your mind is always changing. And so it's, said, it's kind of trying to say, well, we, we are caught up in this cycle of samsara, but it's not a cycle that happens after we die. It's a cycle now. We're constantly in a process of becoming a new person, of craving things, of suffering, and becoming a new person again, over and over again. And then the six realms of rebirth are therefore reinterpreted as states of mind we go through in this life. You know, if you're feeling uh, a lot of craving, you're, you're in the hungry ghost realm. If you're feeling terrible guilt because you did something really bad, then you're in the hell realm. If you're uh, feeling really happy and calm, then you're in the God realm at that time. So that's the way they interpret them. Now, we looked at some of the justifications for interpreting these teachings in this way. And one of the big ones comes from the Kalama Sutta, which is a part of the Pali Canon, one of the teachings of the Buddha. In the Kalama Sutta, as we looked at, the, the Buddha talks to a group of people called the Kalamas, and they are talking about the fact that they've had so many religious teachers coming through their village that they don't know which ones to believe because they're all teaching different stuff. So they ask the Buddha, well, how do we know who to believe? And the Buddha then says this famous thing where he says, do not go upon, and then he lists lots of things that you shouldn't just accept teachings because of this. And, you know, the interesting ones for us are tradition. What is in a scripture? Um, upon the consideration, the monk is our teacher. They say, do, he says, do not go just upon those things. So um, don't just believe in things because it's traditional. Everyone so believes it. Don't believe just because it's written in some holy book. Don't believe just because you're the person who's supposed to be your teacher said it. How should, what should you, uh, why should you believe in stuff then? And he says, well, when you yourself know these things are good, these things are not blameable, these things are praised by the wise, undertaken and observed, these things lead to benefit and happiness, enter on and abide them. So in other words, put them into practice yourself. When you know that they're good, when you know that they bring about happiness, then, uh, then you should follow them. Now, secular Buddhists think that this gives them some license to dismiss some parts of the Buddhist, Buddhist teachings, like karma and rebirth, because they would say, well, look, he says here, don't accept everything in the scripture. He says here, put it into practice. They say, well, we've practiced Buddhism. We've found that you don't need those teachings. And in fact, we find it hard to believe those teachings. So therefore, we don't believe them. 
We also look to the fact that, you know, other Buddhist scholars, Richard Gombrich, who's a scholar of Buddhism, and Bhikkhu Bodhi, who's a scholar and also a practicing Buddhist, he's a Buddhist monk, have actually said that that's a wrong interpretation. What the Buddha actually meant was, if you put his teachings into practice, you would find that they're right. So in other words, what he's saying is, the stuff in the Buddhist scriptures is correct, he's saying, but you don't have to accept, you shouldn't accept it just because it's in the scriptures, you should put it into practice and you will find out that it's true. You might say, but how can you find out that karma and rebirth are true? But remember, Buddhism says that if you get enlightened, like the Buddha did, you can actually see directly that rebirth happens. It, it, the, the Buddha taught rebirth not as a theory, but as something, according to Buddhism, that he had experienced, he'd seen it. Okay, elsewhere in the Kalama Sutta, the Buddha says this, he says there are certain benefits, solaces, of um, uh, of practicing the Buddha's teachings, particularly kind of bringing about the, the non-violent, peaceful state of mind that the, the Buddha aims to bring about. And the, the first two of those solaces are, firstly, if there's if there's rebirth after you, you die, then by following the Buddha's teachings, you'll end up in a higher rebirth. But then it says, suppose there is no hereafter, and there is no fruit, no result of deeds done well or ill. Yet in this world, here and now, free from hatred, free from malice, safe and sound and happy, I keep myself. This is the second solace found by him. So what they, he is saying is, even if there is no rebirth, even if that's not true and no karma, you'll be happy in this life if you follow my teachings. So for secular Buddhists, this is important because it's almost like the Buddha is saying, well, look, my teachings are valid whether or not you believe in rebirth. So it gives them license to say, well, look, yeah, the Buddha said, if you practice his teachings, it will bring you a happy life in this life. They don't believe in rebirth, so they would say, but still, it's still good to follow Buddhism, even if rebirth's not true. We looked at this guy, Stephen Batchelor, a secular Buddhist, probably the most famous example of a secular Buddhist. Probably, I don't know if I've mentioned this before, but I would say that the interesting thing about secular Buddhism is that you don't get that many teachers who expressly say that they're secular Buddhists. In most cases, what happens in the Western world is people just don't emphasize those other aspects of the teachings. So like a Western Buddhist, ter say a Western Buddhist teacher teaching Theravada meditation, they might not expressly say that they're a secular Buddhist, they don't believe in reincarnation and stuff, and rebirth and karma. But they might just never speak about it when they do meditation classes and all the people coming to their classes will have no interest in it. So it's more like ignored most of the time rather than people expressly saying, oh, we don't believe in rebirth. You know, that that's very much the case when you go to a Buddhist um, stuff in the West is that for lots of forms of Buddhism that you find, there won't be a kind of express thing of saying, I don't believe in rebirth but and, and karma, but they'll just be it'll just be ignored as not seen as very important. For Stephen Batchelor, he's quite, I suppose, a little bit rare because he expressly talks about how he doesn't believe in these things and very much says, I am a secular Buddhist uh, in, his, in his teachings. Uh, we looked at him and then we also looked at this, uh, this interesting phenomena. You've got a picture there of the Tibetan Lama Yeshe and then Lama Osul, who was the Spanish kid who was identified as the reincarnation or rebirth of Lama Yeshe. And Stephen Batchelor's article that we looked at uh, kind of look, he had met that that reincarnation, re reborn Lama, and he had a few things to say about whether it was believable or not. So, oops. right, okay. So these were the questions I asked you to answer based on um, the reading from Stephen Baxter. So I'm just going to go through these answers to these questions. So the first one said, "How." How did was, that doesn't make any sense, does it? I'll just change that. How how was Alama Ozil tested to see if he really was Lama Yeshe reborn? So what happened was, the first thing, they the, the way they found him was through, they, they find these reincarnated um, Lamas in Tibetan Buddhism through dreams and through oracles. So monks might have a dream that there's been a re rebirth that's happened in a certain place, so they'll go to that place and try and find the child. Or they might consult an oracle. That's something we will look at later in the course. But in Tibetan Buddhism, there's a belief that certain people can be uh, uh, possessed by the spirit of certain higher beings, Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, gods in the God realm, things like that. And that they, those, they're called oracles, and those oracles can tell you certain things. And so 
in this situation, they would ask the oracle, where has the child been reborn? And the, the oracle might know. In Lama Yeshe's case, there was a dream. The monk had a dream that the Lama had been reborn in... Um, uh, in a and he's seen the kid in a meditation center and he was a westerner so he wasn't tibetan uh, but that's not the question i asked the question was how was he tested so what they did is they put a series of lama yeshe's uh, possessions on a table and they put a lot of other things of the same kind and they asked him to pick them out so the one that mentioned in the reading was his rosary uh, rosary is not really the word the word they use in buddhism is mala a mala is a set of prayer beads rosary is just a, is a roman catholic term that's why he's used it here I suppose so people are more familiar but that he put they put the mala the prayer beads on a table with a lot of other uh, sets of prayer beads including one that was a bit more fancy because they thought maybe the kid would go for the one that's more fancy and uh, and they said pick out your prayer beads and he, the kid picked out the right prayer beads and that is a common test for who is the re reborn lama okay the light blue section uh, what reason for believing in rebirth is given here well, the fact that all religions have taught rebirth and the Buddha taught rebirth, straightforward, this section just says, well, look, all religions in, in history, I don't know if it's true of absolutely all, but the majority have certainly taught, re that, sorry, life after death. Um, all religions, or the majority have taught life after death, and the Buddha taught rebirth. The Buddha said it was true. What reasons are given to suggest, which suggests Buddhists do not have to believe in rebirth, that is the fact that um, the Buddha, this is coming back to the Kalama Sutta, that the Buddha said, Buddha said his teachings are meaningful whether you believe in life after death or not. That is just that second part of the Kalama Sutta that I spoke about earlier in this video. So the Buddha, so that he's basically saying, well, the Buddha says my teachings are meaningful whether or not you believe in rebirth, so you don't really need to believe in it. The pink section here, Baptist suggests that the Buddha may not have taught rebirth because it was something he personally believed in. What other reason is suggested for why the Buddha taught rebirth? So basically he suggests that the Buddha only taught rebirth because all the other religions that, of the time that he he lived in believed in rebirth. And that, you know, there's some ac accuracy in that to some degree. Um, for example, we saw uh, Brahmanism, Jainism, the Arjivakas at the time of the Buddha, all of those groups taught rebirth. Yes, there were some like materialists who didn't believe in rebirth, but by, by far the majority view was that rebirth and karma of some kind were true. It's just worth saying something a bit more about that. So his idea is that, oh, well, maybe the Buddha didn't really have a strong belief in rebirth, but maybe he just believed in it because um, he just kind of picked it up and had saw no reason to to question it. He he was he's more like he was saying, well, the Buddha was interested in other things. So when it came to what happens to life of death, he just accepted what was going on around him. But he was really other interested in other different stuff. There's a couple of reasons to doubt that though. Number one would be it's worth might be worth putting this down in your notes. One reason to to disagree with with back to this conclusion is that when you look at what the Buddha taught about rebirth, it was actually quite different to what the other religions taught. So if you look at Jainism and Brahmanism, yes, they teach rebirth, but they teach the belief in a permanent everlasting soul, like the Atman or the Jiva in um, Jainism, that goes through all these rebirths, whereas the Buddha taught an Atman. Now, some Buddhists have argued, well, if the Buddha was willing to go against the traditions of his time, so much so that he would go, he would completely reject the idea of the Atman or the Jiva, then it seems weird that he would just unthinkingly accept the idea of rebirth. So they're saying, well, that seems to indicate the Buddha did believe in rebirth actively. He didn't just take, pick it up passively. He believed in it actively because if he didn't believe in it, he probably would have rejected it. He didn't, he didn't just pick up things from the religions around him and accept them. That's one criticism. The second criticism, the more traditional Buddhist criticism, is that the Buddha actually, in the Buddhist scriptures, he says that he sees, when he get, got enlightened, he saw the rebirths of all people. So according to Buddhism, the traditional view, the Buddha did, definitely didn't believe in rebirth just because he accepted it because other people said it. He believed in it because he had seen it directly. So there's two criticisms of that point. Okay, number five, the red bit. Why do some Buddhists think that denying rebirth could lead to problems? What does back to the, why does Bachelor think they're wrong? This stuff is about morality. So this is the idea that if people stop believing in rebirth, that means they'll stop believing in karmic punishments in your next life for good or bad actions. 
And the idea is that this will stop them, stop people having, from having any motivation to do good actions, because I would, uh, or at least to avoid bad actions, because the idea would be that believing in rebirth and karma and rebirth means that you believe that if you do something bad in this life, you'll be punished, and if you do something good, you'll be rewarded. And if you take that away, then the people will lack motivation to do good because they won't think there's any reward. They lack motivation to avoid evil because they don't think there's any punishment. What does Bachelor? So that that was the problem that some people think it could lead to. Why does Bachelor think they're wrong? Well, Bachelor look, takes this as evidence what's happened in European society since the time of the Enlightenment. By the Enlightenment here, he doesn't mean um the Buddha's Enlightenment. He means the period of time in Western history where people start to look at the world in a more rational way, the origins of the kind of scientific way of looking at the world, less based on tradition and religion. And, the, and since that time, I'm talking about the 18th century, I'm so bad at my historical period, but 17th, 18th century, that kind of thing. Um, since that time, um, religion has become less influential in our society and you get much more people who are atheist. And you know, when that first started to happen, People were very worried because people felt like, oh, when we get when people become atheists, they'll have no reason to be moral. But actually, he says, like, if we look at what's happened in the Western world, that doesn't seem to be the case. It seems to be the case that people who are, don't believe in life after death. So, you know, so I should say the idea is that you know here there's a comparison, right? Because most people were Christian in the West, and they but they still be, they didn't believe in rebirth, but they did believe in life after death and then re reward and punishment. If you're good, you go to heaven. If you're bad, you go to hell. So the idea again, was a similar idea to the one that some Buddhists have. If you don't believe in um, life after death and a reward and punishment, then you'll have no motivation to be a good person. Uh, Bachelor's criticism of that is to say, well, look, that just hasn't happened. A, our experience is that as people have become atheists in the West, they haven't given up their sense of right and wrong. Not, there are lots of atheists who have a strong sense of right and wrong. In fact, there are many people today who would argue that rewards and punishments is not an adequate basis for the idea of right and wrong. In other words, if you're being a good person because you want to get a reward in the afterlife or to reward it or to avoid a punishment in the afterlife, then you are not doing it for the right reasons. The right reasons would be uh, because you um uh, you know you want to do that you want to do this because it's the right uh, you, you want to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Kind of a little bit reminds me a bit of Kant that argument. Uh, number six, where are we? Uh, why does Bachelor think that for Buddhists, for Buddhists believing in rebirth brings philosophical problems? So there's a, this quite, he goes into some detail, but, but you didn't know it needed all this stuff. But he basically just says that rebirth contradicts seeking of no self. We've looked at that before. How can there be rebirth? How can you be reborn if there's no fixed part of yourself? Now, Buddhism actually would answer that actually, well, it, yes, it's not. It's not, we're not saying that, that person is exactly the same as you. We're not saying they're completely different to you. We're saying that you influence who that person becomes. But he says, well, actually, it makes no sense. If you, rebirth implies that I am reborn. But if there's no fixed part me, what is reborn? Last second, the grey section. Why does Bachelor think that even if it could be proved that someone remembered a past life, it would still not prove that Buddhist teachings of rebirth are true. It's, it goes quite interesting here. He kind of says, well, all it proves, if someone can remember a past life, is that they got reborn once. It doesn't prove that you get reborn again and again. Maybe you get just reborn once or twice and then it finishes. It's an interesting possibility. So he kind of says, even if there were proof, it wouldn't prove exactly what Buddhists want to th say it proves. Lastly, how does the how does Bachelor explain the proof of Lama Osul being Lama Yeshe that's described in, in question one? So in other words, how do we explain that Lama Osul picked out the right rosary? And for that matter, how do we explain the fact that Lama Osul said that he could remember being Lama Yeshe? Well, uh, you know, for the, the memories that Lama Osul had, you could just say, well, they were just based on, you know, people around him telling him stuff about Lama Yeshe. And he kind of, he's internalised that and thinks he can remember. I mean, it's worth saying, that you know, that, that apparently a lot of studies show that most people's earliest memories are, are what we call manufactured memories. Um, that you basically your, your family or whatever tell you stories about what you did when you were a little kid and you remember, you remember it based on the story rather than based on um, 
the actual memory of it happening. And so this could be the case here. He doesn't remember being Lama Yeshe. He, he, he's manufactured those memories based, based on being told about it. I don't know if I've ever told you this, but my, one of my earliest memories is biting a dog. Because when I was about two years old, I, I stood up. I, I was trying to stand up and I leant on the side of a drummer. He was my friend, uh, my uh, friend of the family's their dog. He was called Drummer. And uh, I, he moved and I bit the dog to, because I was a bit angry with him moving. So I wanted to stand up. Um, now, I, I don't think that's a real memory because I was too young at the time to remember that. that, that would be it. But I do remember it in my head. I have a picture of it happening. And uh, that's because people have told me many times afterwards that um, I bit this dog. It was a bit of a, bit of a story at the time. Um, incidentally, that dog died the next year. So I don't know. I didn't like take a chunk out of it. I just had like a mouthful of fur from the dog's back. But uh, I've always felt a bit guilty about it. Anyway, that was a bit of a digression. Um, so yeah, he explained the memories that Lama Osil has can be explained through um, uh, what's the word through fake memories, that kind of thing. The the other thing about him picking up the rosary, well, Bachelor basically has his doubts about that. His idea is that maybe it's all based on body language. In other words, everyone there wants this kid. They they all think they've picked out the right kid. So they, they want some positive affirmation with this kid. So maybe when he goes up to pick the rosaries, maybe he goes near to one of the rosaries that's the wrong one. And you can feel from everyone's body language, everyone's going, oh, don't pick up that one. And so he kind of backs off. Then when he goes near to the right one, everyone's like, yeah, that's the right one. You know, their body language is really positive and he picks it up. Now, who knows if that's what happened. But Bachelor says, I'd like to see these tests carried out in laboratory conditions where there's no one kind of no one's body language you know that there's no one in there who knows the kid or who wants to get the confirmation and so the idea would be it'd be more um more uh, sort of objective conditions and he says do would they really be replicated those results would they really find out that he really could pick out the right things i don't know that's a good question okay so those are that stephen bachelor stuff i thought it was an interesting article Okay, next, what I want to do is to look at the next reading, which is um, some arguments. So we're starting to get put some of this stuff into essay formulation. So really, an essay about this is going to be based on the question of whether it's appropriate or makes sense to interpret teachings about samsara as metaphorical or psychological, or must Buddhists interpret them as real? That's the idea. Now, that's the, these are one, this is one of those questions that's very internal to Buddhism and kind of from the outside, you're like, well, I don't know, do what they want. But um, we're get, you'll come and see that, that it should make sense as we go through this thing. So what, what we're going to do is, first of all, this reading that I've given you has a series of arguments in um, different boxes. There are, they're numbered one to eight, and... Um, I don't know and um, for each one, I just want you to color code it. I have two highlighters. Highlight whether it says, does it say that we can, we can take these teachings to be metaphorical? Teachings about samsara, so karma, rebirth, and uh, realms of rebirth, all that kind of stuff. Or does it say, no, Buddhists should take them literally? Then underneath, I've got a space for a response for each box. Now, what I want you to do is, at this stage, is have the reading in front of you, pause the video, and then go through them and see if you can highlight, see if you can add any responses. So how are they saying, if the point says, yes, we can interpret them metaphorically, one colour. If it says, no, they, we have to say that they're real, another colour. And then underneath, just think, can you add any responses to that point? How could you argue against it? Pause the video, try and do that. And then I'm going to do feedback on that in a minute. Okay. Okay, you should have uh, had, to, had to go at completing that sheet. I've got a copy of it in front of me. And so I am basically just going to go through uh, what what colour you should have highlighted and uh, what the response could have been. So the first one, all our evidence suggests that the Buddha viewed samsara in a literal way and the Buddhist tradition has taught samsara as literal truth for over 2,000 years. In the Pali Canon, the Buddha says, that not believing in karma and rebirth is a wrong view which will lead to an unhappy rebirth in one's next life. 
However, as Baxter points out, just because Buddhism has always taught rebirth, this does not necessarily mean it is true. Now, um, so that point, the first point, I mean, the second bit is going against it, but the first point, the main point is to say that, yes, it should be real. You should interpret it real because the Buddha taught it as real, um, as literal, and the Buddhist tradition has always taught it over, two, over 2,000 years as a literal fact. How can we argue against it? Well, the point that I've put there, just because Buddhism has always taught it's true doesn't mean it's true. Not a great response. What could we say more than that? Well, I would go to the Kalama Sutta because it's the Kalama Sutta that that, that um, uh, people like Bachelet are most often used to say, well, look, yes, the Buddha taught it, but the Buddha also said we don't need to... Um, don't need to take everything in the scriptures literally and the buddha also said um uh, and the buddha also said in the karma sutta that even if karma and rebirth are not true then his teachings still bring you happiness so all of that would make people think yes okay buddhism has always taught it but that doesn't doesn't seem to mean doesn't necessarily mean that we have to believe in it because we've got some reasons here why we don't need to believe in it if we're buddhists um a couple of other things to add here um you know when it says that um not believing in calm rebirth is a wrong view which leads to an unhappy rebirth in one's next life that's interesting because that seems to go against what he says in the calm so you have to balance those two things out and also wrong view is part of the eightfold path so it's an impediment on getting to enlightenment it would seem um if you've got the wrong view so that that could be a serious point um so yeah, that that there's the the fours and against there for uh, whether you need um, for that first point. Um, you might also put I was going to say, say against. You might also put Steve a bachelor's point that maybe the Buddha you know one thing about maybe the Buddha only taught karma and rebirth because it was the what people other people believed in his lifetime and he he didn't it wasn't something he passionately believed in. We've seen that point before. Okay, next one. Empiricists, those people who just believe in empirical evidence from your senses, argue that we can only believe in things for which we have evidence from our senses. So, oh, just repeat myself there. There seems to be little evidence in favour of rebirth. So, from an empiricist point of view, we have little reason to accept the truth. So, you could just say, well, hold on. We should really, if we're going to believe in stuff, but we should believe in stuff with empirical evidence, and there's not any empirical evidence. Well, what can we say? Well, you can directly direct this, directly link this to point four, where it actually starts to look at. Um, some of the evidence so there are there is some empirical evidence whether it's good in the evidence or not is, is different different question also as i said before the buddha claim, claimed to have seen it at rebirth directly and therefore if the buddha can see it directly that means all of us can because that, we can all reach the state of enlightenment the buddha reached so um yes there might maybe we could say even if we don't believe there's any empirical evidence here in this world, or for us now, if we reached enlightenment, we would have, I don't know if we say empirical evidence, but it's something, it's like a direct knowledge. So um, Buddhists would say that is, a, that that's a, 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 the Buddha's knowledge of rebirth, they would say is as strong as empirical evidence because he saw it for himself. Of course, the problem there becomes that we have to, we have to either get to enlightenment ourselves or believe the word of people who are enlightened. Okay. Okay, number three. The idea that rebirth and the 12 links of dependent relations should be understood as happening in each moment, uh, and not only at the moment of death, is not something invented by modern sacred Buddhists. As Rupert Gethin has pointed out, good old Rupert Gethin, the Theravada tradition has always taught that these processes can be understood as happening at every moment in our lives. However, this interpretation was not given as an alternative to the idea of rebirth at the end of life. The traditional teaching is that we are reborn in each moment and at the end of life. Now, this is a really important point, right? So, yes, in the Theravada tradition, it's always been said that, yes, we are reborn moment to moment. That is not exclusively a new uh, secular Buddhist teaching. And the idea that karma has, you know, our actions have psychological effects within this life. Yes, that's always been part of... Um, uh of the buddhist tradition but the but and this is the response the response is actually in here in in this number three um you just need to kind of highlight uh, pick it out and explain it again underneath is that yeah while the traditional teaching would say yes of course rebirth happens moment to moment and you know yes 
there's a way in a way you can say that you're in the god realm during this life and the holy holy the hungry ghost realm all that kind of reinterpretation all that time of interpretation that that is seen as that is not seen as taking away from the fact that these things also happen after you die so it's not in the tradition in the secular buddhist view would be it's only moment to moment rebirth it only happens in this life but the the um traditional buddhist view is yes rebirth happens moment to moment but rebirth also happens when you die so it's it's real it has those those psychological elements a part of it but it's also something real so that point would uh, so that point the, the point i was making in number three the highlighting bit should have you know for, for your for your first task the highlighting that should have been a point to say yes we could interpret them metaphorically or psychologically but the point is that the Theravada tradition does not think that we could interpret them psychologically as opposed to literally. It just thinks we should use both interpretations. Okay, traditional Buddhists, number four, traditional Buddhists argue that there is some evidence proving the truth of rebirth, past life memories. Many cases of children who can remember past life have been studied by Professor Ian Stevenson, an American psychologist who has published his findings in the book, 20 Cases Suggestive of Reincarnation. These cases feature children from many parts of the world and in some cases, the details they can remember are remarkable. Yeah, so this is some interesting stuff. Um, uh, uh, the difficulty about this, though, is that um, that it's very difficult unless we have particular cases. I don't, we don't want to go down the route of looking at particular case studies of people who claim to remember a past life uh, at this stage, I don't think. Um, so what can we say about it? Well, what we could say is this. One thing is majority of cases of people who remember past lives are found in cultures where belief in a past life is is dominant so like in india and places like that now why is that important that would be important because it it could for a skeptic it could make them distrust the idea that um that the distrust the idea that, that the, the, the child who believes that remembers past life has come up with that idea on their own. It might be that they've been influenced by the fact that everyone around them believes in past lives to believe in a past life. And then, you know, in terms of the, the you know, sometimes children can, can like say things or, um, what's the word? Express views which are, or, or have knowledge, which would be, it seems that they could only have got if they, if they were a reincarnation of someone else. Well, you know, it, the sort of things that Bachelor says can be used to criticise that, to say, well, look, people, it, maybe that the people's memories are manufactured, maybe that there's people around them who want to believe that they've got a past life and they've, uh, you know, in their interactions with those people, they've taken on board facts that those other people knew. In some cases, that could be on purpose, so people might be doing it as, you know, might, there might be some kind of... Um, uh, deception going on but in other cases maybe it's just um, you know like like Bachelor was saying this positive reinforcement people the, the child's parents or some people want to believe the child is a re a reincarnation of the person who lived before and so the child um, acts in ways that they think the parents will like and therefore reinforce their views that they are that person from before there's a complicated issue that because i just think we get into you really have to look at case studies to find out whether we can believe in this stuff or not okay number five from a tr traditional buddhist perspective it could be argued that giving up literal belief in common rebirth would give people less motivation to do good actions and avoid evil if it's not believed that our good actions will bring rewards and our bad actions will bring punishments wouldn't people lose their motivation to lead an ethical life so that would be an argument for saying we should believe in these things literally they should be real and that the um response would be from bachelor the article we looked at remember bachelor said well in in europe we used to be a very christian country everyone believed in life after death and rewards and punishments uh, now we're not. Uh, is Europe, uh, uh, Europe is less Christian, and there was this big fear that because of that people would uh, have no reason to be moral. But we have not found that. In fact, it's really good to add that point in. In fact, many people today who are not religious would find the idea of rewards and punishments as an inadequate basis for morality. In, in other words, they'd say that if you're right and wrong is based on. Um, rewards and punishments then you're not really doing things for the right reason number six stephen bachelor argues that the teaching of literal rebirth after death 
contradicts the idea of no self. If there is no fixed, unchanging soul, then how can we say that a person is reborn when they die? So that would be an argument saying they have to be that it should be psychological or metaphorical because it's basically saying that it makes no sense for it to be literal. How could you respond? Well, Buddhism, Buddhism would say that look, they're not saying it's the exact same person because they're not saying that there is a fixed self. Even within this life, there's no fixed self. But what they would say is that the person reborn is caused by the person, the karmic actions of the person who died. And in fact, what they'd say is, well, there's no fixed self be between you when you were a child and you now. They would say there's nothing fixed about the two. You know, you, you, when, when you're a little baby and when, you, when you're when older, they would say um, there's nothing fixed about the two. But we still say, just for... For, for the sake of argument that, that you're the same person in the same way Buddhists would say you're we call the person who's reborn based on your karma you but it's not the same you that died because there is no fixed you so Buddhism would say like that you could use your examples of, of the that we, we talked about that it's that story about the mangoes and the mango tree but that was a confusing story let's face it okay number seven karma and rebirth are vital to the practices of what Melford Spurridge called Karmatic Buddhism. For most Buddhists throughout history, the main focus of, of religious life has been making merit for themselves and their deceased loved ones. Without a literal interpretation of samsara, these practices make no sense. Okay, um, yes, this would be an argument for believing in a real um, uh, interpretation because the point is, you know, you have to believe that literally feeding monks brings karmic merit, not just a good psychological feeling karmic merit which is going to get you somewhere in your next life and you have to believe that the realms of rebirth are real so you can get to the god realm and you have to believe literally that you're reborn for those things to make sense how do we argue against it well you could just argue but the point is the karmic karmatic buddhism is not really what the buddha had in mind when he taught buddhism he taught people to try and get rid of their greed hatred and ignorance get rid of all their suffering and reach enlightenment arguably and we'll come into this point next to, but next but arguably you could do you can do all those things try and free your mind from greed hate, hatred and ignorance without any belief in um karma and rebirth that's what that would be your argument against it okay number eight it could be argued that the whole idea of escaping from samsara and reaching nirvana only makes sense if we take nirvana, samsara literally for buddhists part of the suffering of samsara is that we are continually reborn again and again we can never find rest or peace in the endless round of rebirths so escaping to nirvana is important if we only have one life then this urgency to reach nirvana is removed we will one day reach a state of peace uh, free from suffering when we die so the urgency of finding peace and an end to suffering now is lost so this is a really interesting one a difficult one to really uh, uh, argue against in some ways because yeah th this kind of makes sense in a way the the wheel of life is the and the, the teachings of samsara that it embodies the background of everything that the buddha is saying the buddha is saying that he wants to escape from constant uh, rebirth and get to samsara get to nirvana if he didn't believe in that then yeah maybe he couldn't he just if he didn't believe in reincarnation couldn't he just live a life of uh, pleasures now and then uh what's the word live a life of just pleasure now, not, not needing to give up craving and stuff. And then just when he died, then he would have that sense of peace anyway. He'd, so he'd enjoy his life now, and then he'd just get the peace of uh, death, where there is no suffering and stuff like that. Um, how do you argue against it? Well, um, I think people, secular Buddhists might say that that misunderstands kind of Buddhist psychology, which is that you're actually you could actually be happier now in this life through practicing Buddhism. Buddhism is not all about... Buddhism is, yes, about escaping from samsara, but it's also about escaping from suffering here and now and becoming happier here and now. After all, the Buddha said, if you teach his, if you follow his teachings, back to the Kalama Sutta, then you will be happier in this life, not just in the next life, right here in this life. So um, the, the Buddha thought that you could escape from... you could reach happiness here and now by following his teachings you know and secular buddhists would say more generally that you know um the whole point is that a life of uh, uh indulging in cravings and just getting all the things that you crave actually bring doesn't bring you even doesn't bring you happiness now it's not like it brings you great happiness now and then 
you um and then when you die you get reborn you know that's when the suffering comes no they'd say the suffering comes even now that you know things like viparinama dukkha we did we 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 never reach this fixed state of happiness and so on and so on so they would say no you've got to try and get happiness for yourself now get rid of suffering now and therefore you don't need to believe in samsara and rebirth and all that kind of stuff to believe um to believe that it's good to get to nirvana that's the debate i think it's quite an interesting one in a way because i do think that in some ways if you don't believe in it literally then something of the vitalness of getting to um nirvana does seem to be lost for me because it seems to me that like the the in buddhism you know to become a monk and live that hard life of a monk it's almost like you've got to have this idea of like well i'm you know i'm stuck in this never ending i can never get any peace because i'm in this never ending cycle and it's only by this different kind of life that i can get out of that cycle if you think that you've just got one life then isn't it more easy to think well yes i will i'm not stuck i will reach that peace when my life ends that it'll, it'll be over and therefore wouldn't living as a monk be seen as a bit of a waste of that one life i don't know it's an interesting thing to dwell upon um okay so this is what i want you to do for the rest of the, so this you know hopefully should have taken you most of one lesson for the rest of the lesson i want you to try and do this i'm going to want you to plan plan an essay and i want you to write a peril towards it now I'm not going to give you any kind of plan here. I want you to see if you can come up with three perils. But having said that, there's loads of information on that sheet that should help you because it's backwards and forwards. It makes most sense to interpret Buddhist teachings about samsara in metaphorical and psychological ways is the essay. So you want to be giving me three perils. So, you know, you could look at, for example, I'm not planning it, but you could look at, um, is there any empirical evidence? You could have a peril on that to believe in these things. Um, uh, the Buddha, you could talk about well the buddha taught these things so the buddha taught these things as literal so surely it makes most sense to interpret them as literal and then look at the kalama sutta you could look at it that way uh you could get on the route of morality and talk about you know well you need to interpret them as literal because of otherwise morality is lost or is it lost um that kind of thing i'd like you to do a little bit of an in to plan something of an introduction think about these things when you talk about met my metaphorical and psychological, that's a good place to show off your knowledge and show that, well, this is how, that this is what it means, you know, to, to, to interpret it metaphorically and psychologically. Here are how some Western Buddhists have interpreted it. When you look at your implications, well, link it back to Western Buddhists. Western Buddhist teachers like Stephen Batchelor teach it in this way. And so the implications of this question are, is what is what, Stephen Batchelor does a legitimate way of teaching Buddhism or is it totally against what the Buddha taught and so on and so on so yeah give me some kind of introduction you don't need to write a full conclusion but you need to make sure that you've got that you're telling me what your thesis is going to be overall what do you think and I want you to write up in full one peril I hope that makes sense uh you know I'm around so if you've got if there's questions about it let me know if you finish this task, you're going, you're handing in an essay next week about meditation. Um, that I'll set, I'll make sure I've got a date set for that for you. But um, yeah, just continue with that essay if you've got free time. I'm not going to set another video for today's lesson. Okay, thanks a lot, guys.